So welcome everyone uh, to our third webinar in our three-part webinar series sponsored by the Rutgers Institute for Corporate Social Innovation and Rutgers Business School's Executive Education. And I want to give a very special shout out to PwC for their generous support for the entire webinar series. Today, our focus is on shared prosperity, leveling the playing field through inclusive upskilling, innovation, and entrepreneurship. We are thrilled to have Lanier Richardson, Executive Director of Rutgers Center for Urban Entrepreneurship and Economic Development, affectionately known as CUDE, and Bushan Sethi, a global practice leader at PwC. I will introduce both of them in a bit. I'm Gina Wurtenberg, and I have the great privilege of helping to lead the Rutgers Institute for Corporate Social Innovation and also teach several related courses at Rutgers. I noticed some of my students have joined us today, which is great. I wanted to mention that you can chat questions at any time, and we will be monitoring them throughout the session and also saving time for Q&A at the end. If we call your name, you're free to unmute yourself and ask your question. So we have a lot to cover today, so let's get started. I'm going to set the context for about 10 minutes by briefly speaking about where we are today with regard to sustainability, the wealth chasm, the racial wealth gap, and how this has been exacerbated by COVID-19. Second, I'll briefly describe the concept of shared prosperity as it is currently thought about and introduce our speakers who are actually helping to do something about these seemingly intractable challenges. A key question for this webinar is, how can private organizations help lift in need communities and how can all three sectors come together to create a world where prosperity is shared by all? We see here, we are living through unprecedented times and normal will never be the same. We have one catastrophic, catastrophic event which can skew everything. We have pandemic, pandemics, mega cyclones, fire maelstroms, severe long-term droughts, not to mention wars. In 2022, we have all of these around the globe at once. But I love this quote by one of the founders of the sustainability movement, Danella Meadows. Deborah, if you could click on that, please. Great. And Danella said, the sustainability revolution will be organic. It will, be, it will arise from the visions, insights, experiments, and actions of billions of people. The burden of making it happen is not on the shoulders of any one person or group. No one will get the credit, but everyone can contribute. So, what we see here is that wealth inequalities have increased at the very top of the distribution. Global multimillionaires have captured a disproportionate share of global wealth over the last several decades. In 2016, the top 1% took 38% of all additional wealth accumulated since the mid 1990s, whereas the bottom 50% captured just 2% of it. This inequity stems from serious inequality in growth rates between the top and the bottom segments of the wealth distribution. And in 2020, marked the steepest increase of global billionaire share of wealth on record. So this, show, this chart shows how US wealth was concentrated in 2019. Here you see, with the top 10% of US families owning 76% of all wealth, the middle 40% owning 22% of the wealth and the bottom 50% with 64 million families owning just 1% of the wealth with 13 million families in this group actually having negative self-worth, i.e. they're living in debt. On the next chart, you see that the US is a country of tremendous economic opportunity. However, we all know that the opportunity isn't shared equally. Currently, long-standing wealth gaps across race, 
gender, and class are widening, fueled by evolving technologies, shifting labor markets, changing demographics, and continued racial bias. While the labor market generates considerable opportunity for the people and places already equipped for success in the digital era, while simultaneously creating new barriers to economic opportunity for women, people of color, and other underrepresented populations, as well as geographies that are struggling to compete. So on the next chart, we see that how COVID has actually reversed these four, it's called reversals of fortune. And the World Bank report said that it is the quality of schooling that is key to poverty reduction for both non-poor and poor students in both rural and urban areas alike. I also thought it was very interesting that they pointed out that although the pandemic has different impacts on different social groups, the fact that all are affected is an opportunity for leaders to promote a sense of social inclusion and collective resolve, the benefits of which could extend beyond the crisis. And they went on to say that reversing even a massive for reversal of fortune, such as what we are seeing today, is possible. It has been done many times in the past in the face of what were regarded at the time as insurmountable challenges. For example, eradicating smallpox, ending World War II, closing the ozone hole, and it will be done again in the future. So this global crisis is a defining historical moment and the world needs to commit to cooperation and coordination both within and between countries. And we must commit to working together and to working better for the long term. So in this context, I wanna introduce the notion of, or the concept of shared prosperity. So shared prosperity has recently gained prominence as a development objective, a social goal that should be pursued by all nations and all businesses in the world. It's been adopted as one of two central objectives that are meant to guide everything the World Bank does, and a very closely associated objective is listed as goal 10.1 of the UN Sustainable Development Goals. So how does this fit into sustainability? I love these core sustainability concepts, which put it simply as enough for all forever. Capturing the three key foundations of a sustainable world based on systems thinking, socioeconomic justice, and intergenerational responsibility. Deborah, if you could click on that. Great. Enough for all forever, this phrase was attributed to an unnamed African elder who used the phrase when asked to define sustainable development at a UN conference. Within this context, what is this inclusive innovation? I recently attended and was thrilled to be part of uh, my colleague, professor and provost, Jeff Robinson's Prudential Chair inaugural event where he defined inclusive innovation in this way, and I love this definition. Inclusive innovation is the idea that the visionaries, inventors, entrepreneurs, and gatekeepers of innovation should be as diverse as our nation. So there are three reasons for this that Jeff talked about. The social justice imperative, we must do this, it's also critical for our national competitiveness and also because diverse teams lead to better innovations. I also love Des Desmond Tutu, everything he said, but specifically on Ubuntu and interconnection. Ubuntu, which some of you may have heard of the term, translates as I am because we are, or the belief in a universal bond of sharing that connects all humanity. And today people associate Ubuntu with this interconnection. My humanity is closely bound up with yours as Archbishop Desmond Tutu stated. It serves as a reminder that no one is an island and that everything you do, good or bad, has an influence on your family, friends, and society. It also urges us to reconsider our actions and the impact they may have on others. So at this point, it's my great pleasure to introduce our two speakers. Bhushan 
Sethi is a global practice leader, pragmatic strategist, and practitioner with a demonstrable track record of working with financial institutions, leading global organizations, designing and implementing integrated business and workforce strategies to enable sustainable business, customer financial and regulatory outcomes. He's also an adjunct professor for NYU Stern School of Business, where he teaches the consulting practice course to MBA students. Lanier Richardson is the executive director of the Center for Urban Entrepreneurship and Economic Development, CUDE, at Rutgers University in Newark, where he leads capacity building programs that have assisted 600 plus New Jersey entrepreneurs and founded the Black and Latino Investment Fund. He's also assistant professor of professional practice in the Department of Management and Global Business, my department, at Rutgers Business School. And he was recently named a non-resident senior fellow with the Brookings Institution. So please join me in welcoming Bouchon and Lanier. Yay. Good, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Great. Right. Delighted to be here. Excellent. So we're going to turn off the PowerPoints and now we're going to have a conversation for the rest of our time. So my first question is for Lanier. Tell us a little bit about yourself, your career, and how you got into this area. And why is shared prosperity so important to you personally and professionally? Great. So uh, you know, I discovered my career interest really at age 27. And I can articulate it now in a way that I couldn't articulate it, you know, that day I had the feeling. Uh, seeing value in people and places that other people overlook or undervalue, that's uh, what's inspired me uh, for the last 25 plus years as a professional. I work to empower entrepreneurs to strengthen economic conditions in urban and underserved areas, really across the United States. Uh, I have multiple hats. Uh, I invest in commercial real estate. You know, I enjoy educating uh, young minds uh, and I MBA students at Rutgers. Uh, I consult to corporations and big foundations and some government agencies. All of my work is around structuring deals to get capital to people in places that are overlooked or undervalued. That's, uh, that's what I'm passionate about. And I often um, use that passion to uh, do what we are calling today shared prosperity. Uh, to me, I refer to it in a lot of my work as inclusive economic growth or inclusive economic development work which is really uh, creating long-term value for people in America, increasing the productivity of people, uh, helping more people participate in our global economy. Uh, and a lot of my work uh, uh, really unapologetically is around helping black people in America uh, and Latinx people in America to own assets, to find career opportunities in growth sectors, uh, and to really focus on um, where they they can where there is wealth creation opportunity. So that's what shared prosperity means to me. It's uh, figuring out a way to include people who have traditionally been overlooked into economic growth, uh, and ultimately the result will be uh, you know higher GDP, uh, you know more economic competitiveness for our country. Wonderful. I love that. I'm so inspired. So you guys heard me talk about all these problems and these wonderful speakers are actually doing something about it and making it happen. So um, let me ask the same question to Bhushan. Tell us a little bit about yourself, your career, and why is shared prosperity so important to you personally and professionally? Thanks, Gina. Um, really honored to be having this discussion with you and Lanier uh, today. Um, the reason it's important to me is because back to the data you showed and other data, I think we're going backwards on shared pro pro um, prosperity. I think our political system's not helping, the way we allocate capital, the way we make, the way we measure success, whether it's GDP at a country level or whether it's kind of profitability and financial measures from a, from a business perspective. Um, I've spent 25 years helping companies um, define and execute different parts of their business and, and organization strategies. And, and one of the roles I've taken on in probably the last five to 10 is working with policymakers at institutions like the World Economic Forum and the G20 and others here in the US like Chambers of Commerce 
to give back and actually provide some business lenses into how do you make policy in these areas? How do you make policy that actually addresses systemic racism or underrepresented minorities or better definitions of good jobs and workforce productivity as Lynette described? So that's that's what why I'm passionate about the topic and that's why I feel at this stage of my life and career and, and frankly privilege as a business leader is to kind of work with others to um, to kind of provide insights that are that are helpful. I love how you work across sectors, across business and into policy do domains and globally with the World Economic Forum. It's fantastic. So we're going to dive deeper into that. And I'm going to go back to Lanier and ask him, can you help us understand why investors, business leaders and grant makers have made commitments to investing in a more equitable and inclusive economy? Yes, literally since 2020. Uh, Corporations have made unprecedented financial commitments to catalyze uh, inclusive economic growth. Uh, I call it, we know the period of 2020 was pandemic, was protest uh, following the you know, tragic murder of George Floyd and others, uh, and uh, political pandemonium. <laughs> so, you know, when I think about 2020, and out of that period, uh, you know, there were over $70 billion of announced commitments to catalyze economic growth initiatives, racial justice investing initiatives in America. Uh, and savvy executives are finding ways to structure public-private partnerships that, you know, generate revenue, increase profitability, and increase employee engagement as well. Um, what I found uh, that many corporate leaders now are trying to find ways to invest in initiatives because they recognize uh, that that investment will strengthen communities, can address systemic inequalities, and can actually close the racial wealth gap that we all uh, recognize. What's interesting is there was a study, uh, Pew Research, uh, as I recall, that most Americans really do believe our economy can be bolstered by fueling more diverse business growth. But interestingly, a, a third of people don't really know how to make a difference, right? And so that's the work that we have an opportunity to do at Rucker, Rutgers Business School. That's, you know, I conduct a, a seminar on inclusive growth and public-private partnerships, you know, that really talk about how to strengthen the American economy by supporting, you know, racially diverse entrepreneurs, uh, recognizing the importance of place-based economic development strategies, you know, framing the business case for intentionality around inclusive economic development and growth. So again, I think we're in a moment in time where corporate leaders have recognized uh, this clarion call to strengthen, you know, our you know, our economy and really our global economy by getting more people, you know, involved in leading and driving, you know, and owning that growth. That is so inspiring. So actually helping to address the problem at a systemic level and working with the different institutions for public-private partnerships. Great. Yes. Um, Bushan, can you share your thoughts on how businesses are currently balancing their focus on profits and purpose in light of today's economic headwinds? Um, so the term stakeholder capitalism has probably been with us for at least five years. I remember about three years ago, the business roundtable said that we're going to focus on stakeholders, not shareholders. We're in we're in an economic downturn, however you want to define it, you know, a technical recession, if you will, in the US. Um, but when you look around, we still make decisions based on the financial aspects of that scorecard, um, whether it's what we're seeing in sectors around layoffs, whether you look at kind of how we make decisions around capital, how we achieve value, how we're so focused on, you know, daily movements in stock prices. Um, and not all the other aspects of thinking about a business and what it does for its customers and its and its people. And the way you treat people in, in tough times is really visible. It's visible to everyone. It's visible to the new generation of workers. So um, I, think the, I think the business probably gets a B minus around how it's done it. And there's a great intent and there's obviously some great organizations that, that live this better than others. 
But by and large, and I think it does come back to the way that we think about the economic system and what we value in this country and, and, and others, but primarily kind of here when we have a fixation on, on markets and capital and economic returns. And the more we can get balance around, around some of those other aspects around inclusion and well-being and all the, all the lessons that we've learned during the pandemic, that's, that's my hope for the future. Great. Can you say a little more about what steps companies can take to advance their shared prosperity agendas? Yeah. So many, many, especially public organizations out there uh, will talk about their purpose. They'll talk about values. They'll talk about the importance of um, all aspects of diversity, equity, and inclusion. Um, and so, and there's some transparency into things like gender reporting. There's some mandatory ESG type disclosures, but the more companies can actually just lean in and be much more transparent on what they are doing to create economic security. Linair mentioned kind of job creation. The best way to drive inclusion is to create jobs so that people can have economic security. So the more businesses can talk about how they're hiring from different um, different backgrounds, how they're creating on ramps um, into their into their workforce. Um, how they are tracking the progression of underrepresented minorities, um, how they're taking action to be much more inclusive. We have a labor force participation that's stubbornly in, this, in the 60s in terms of percentage, getting more people back into the workforce. Forget about return to office, but actually getting more people in the workforce, caregivers, retirees, younger people, people without college degrees, ex-convicts, wh whatever it may be. That's what businesses can do individually and collectively, like through chambers of commerce and other industry groups. But it, businesses isn't gonna business isn't gonna do it just because it's the right thing to do necessarily. There's got to be some degree of regulation and guardrails around this, and we've got to work with the education system, um, primary school, secondary schools, etc. So I think there's a lot that business can do. Um, it needs to work together, but I do think some healthy transparency around all of those aspects and being honest around what they are going to drive and what they can control is, is probably a good starting point. Outstanding. Excellent. All right. I'm going to ask Lanier a question. Um, so can you explain to everyone how patient and flexible capital from private, public, and philanthropic sources can actually help close these racial gaps in income and wealth and strengthen communities? Sure. Um, yeah, I have a stump speech that um, can be summarized as follows, that wealth is created by owning assets assets that generate revenue, assets that appreciate over time. Sometimes they have tax advantages. And so if we're going to close the racial wealth gap, we gotta focus on helping people of color in America, which is the predominant, when you showed that chart and it goes 40%, uh, you know, not having uh, asset ownership is largely people of color. And uh, closing that gap by helping people own businesses, on property, um, on intellectual property, whether it's intellectual property or real property, owning assets that will generate revenue and appreciate over time is, is core to the strategy of closing racial wealth gaps. Uh, one of the things that we found in our work at the Center uh, for Urban Entrepreneurship and Economic Development at Rutgers is that there's a need for patient, flexible capital, equity-like capital. Uh, many people of color, because of systemic inequality that has been part of the history of America, don't have access to the friends and family round of capital, don't have access and um, is ready access to banking, uh, you know, capital from banking system. So, you know, we define patient capital as uh, investment in entrepreneurs uh, that will help them start or expand the business or uh, buy a piece of commercial real estate. And we found that there are different types of investors providing uh, this patient capital, uh, whether it's mission-oriented impact investors, you know, individuals, it's sometimes it's grants, sometimes it's low interest loans, uh, sometimes it's equity, most times it's with a long-term horizon and impact measures of financial gain, not just directly return on investment, but 
Our community is getting stronger. Is crime decreasing? Our educational outcomes, uh, you know, uh, you know, improving. You know, measuring uh, metrics around social determinants of health. If patient capital is done right, all of these things, uh, you know, are part of the result. Love that. So tell us more, Lanier, about what initiatives and strategies you've been piloting by the Center for Urban Entrepreneurship and Economic Development at Rutgers Business School to drive yeah. this kind of inclusive innovation. Really exciting. You know, Rutgers is a great place uh, for this work. The dean of our business school has made social impact one of our three strategic priorities. Uh, we have a provost where you have just mentioned, uh, Gina, that is, uh, you know, made his academic uh, career around inclusive innovation and social entrepreneurship. We have a chancellor in Rutgers Newark who's, uh, you know, an international proponent of publicly engaged scholarship. So it's in that context that we do the work at our center which is to integrate scholarship and private industry, government, nonprofit, corporate, to support this inclusive economic development work. What I'm most excited about is a lot of our stuff uh, is related to uh, identifying entrepreneurs who uh, can be innovators, entrepreneurs, diverse entrepreneurs who uh, are driving growth companies, tech, tech-enabled, tech-adjacent uh, opportunities, as well as, you know, getting them early stage patient capital, as I just mentioned. So we started a Black and Latinx Angel Fund. Uh, Dr. Jeff Robinson did some interesting work around helping more people of color access small business innovation research grants from the federal government. We've gotten capital from big foundation and from some of our banking partners to help entrepreneurs um, you know, more grant capital to help them get financial systems in place and credit repair and, you know, get on the on-ramp. Our big program, which I'm most excited about, and we summarize it as a thousand million. Can our little center help a thousand diverse entrepreneurs generate a million dollars a year of annual recurring revenue? That annual million dollars, as many people on this call know, is not the end all be all, it's just a threshold of viability. I have some customer validation, we have some product, we have some, you know, hopefully there's a, the owner's comp and maybe one or more employees, but I thought it's a thousand times a million is a billion. So could our little center, you know, help to get a thousand urban underserved, urban entrepreneurs operating in urban areas and underserved areas, get to a million dollars a year of annual recurring revenue, a billion dollars of economic impact. At our last count, we had over 270 and uh, we're continuing to, to push that agenda. That's fantastic. So um, we absolutely want you to be able to do that and uh, we'll cheer you on and support it in every way we can. All right, so Bushan, um, can you help explain how companies are measuring the effectiveness of executing their shared prosperity agendas? Yeah, so so that there's some there's going to be some transparency around the business results, and again, like we said, it's gonna it's gonna be led with financials, but there's obviously going to be discussions around what are we doing around our employees, their well being, their employability, um, what are we doing across our supply chain around shared prosperity. How are our business models, if I'm a bank, actually helping small, medium businesses, diverse businesses grow and kind of get a rung on that kind of economic ladder? I do think one of the things that we're not measuring enough is how we driving improving societal issues. So one of the big societal issues we have in the U.S. is polarization. Um, we have a significant amount of people who are on either sides of a topic, whether it's a political topic, a social topic. Return to office has become this ridiculously polarized discussion and it doesn't need to be and so the more that we can actually understand and businesses can start to say have I engaged all of the constituents in a particular discussion um, if I'm going to be thinking about making layoffs if I engage lots of people to say are there alternatives to layoffs can we take less profit for this year can we provide less kind of stock income or, or deferred equity income to executives and and how do we do that and so what I really worry about is 
and Linnea was kind of talking about the investment story and the investment thesis, we need to bring more people into this discussion. A lot of people probably listening in here already buy into this concept. What I want to do is engage people who don't care about shared prosperity. And I hear it so much in my private discussions with friends and colleagues and clients in that we live in efficient markets. The market will take care of these topics. Capitalism is the best invention in the world. And whilst all of that is absolutely right, we have seen rising inequality. So I'm not saying that we should kind of walk away from that, but something needs to change in how we measure and value and create opportunities. And again, in, our, in the role that we can control as, as business people. Yeah, the moment is calling for us to do capitalism differently, right? It's not, it is a great system. Uh, but that's what the moment I believe is giving us an opportunity to think in a more in a systemic way. How do we how do we do capitalism better? But we need to tell that story, Linair, in a way that doesn't make people fearful that we're coming for for their tax revenue or yes. that we're just looking to provide charity and handouts to people who don't want to work. Like we really need to make sure that that story is connected in in Kansas, in New Delhi, wherever it may be, in, in Manhattan. It, it's so important that we get out there um, and there needs to be a real campaign around this. Otherwise, we are just, it's going to go the way of many other kind of social topics uh, we've seen over the years. Sorry, Gina. Back to oh, you. no, not at all. Um, there was just a chat that um, Michelle Scott asked, what is your perception of the value of relationship capital in inclusive economic development and shared prosperity? How do we address the individualist culture, which has been a challenge? Yeah, I think, you know, Prashant and both, both were alluding to that. This is, um, how do we have, uh, how do we use our relationships to get to a place where we can have civil discourse and set common objectives that will, will you know, lessen the racial wealth gap, will address the income inequality issues that you know, are, are causing uh, challenges in our systems. And the way that that can only be done is sometimes it's a human, or, you know, a human connection, right? That we both have to leverage as, as Michelle is uh, referencing relationship capital to be able to say, I believe your interest is genuine. I believe we both want to see a better America, a better world, uh, and that um, we can do that in a way where, um, you know, inclusion, inclusive economic growth doesn't mean, or shared prosperity doesn't mean, uh, uh, you know, you lose and I win, or it doesn't right. mean, you know, uh, charity in a way that's, um, you know, uh, encouraging non-productivity uh, doesn't mean that you can't still have profitable operations. Absolutely. So there's the triple bottom line or the win-win, and we all can win, and we all raise all boats at the same time. I'm going to ask Linda Morris Kelly from Transitioning to Green. She had a question, and your hand is raised. Unmute yourself, please. Yes. Ahead, thank Linda. you. Um, I think this fits in with the conversation we're having. Earlier this morning, I was um, on a webinar that the Brookings Institute had with uh, Dr. Susan Collins, who is the new uh, president of the Boston Fed. And they were talking about mon monetary policy. And I raised the question there about uh, after listening for a half an hour, how they are including some of the issues that we're talking about and also climate change into the development of um, monetary policy. And it seems that they're not. Um, and I had this conversation with the previous uh, Boston Fed director. Um, while they're doing, the feds are doing a pretty good job of um, engaging with community through the working communities program that has been in New England for now eight years and is now being adopted by the Atlanta Fed. Um, climate change and putting the voices at the table of the communities that are undervalued and the um, scientists and nonprofits and businesses who are working to 
reduce their impact on climate change and to reverse it. That doesn't seem to be in a consideration at all. So my question is, how can we as practitioners in these areas um, get our voices heard at the highest level of policy making in the United States and in other countries? Great question. Um, who wants to respond, Bouchon? I'd say from a from a business angle, what well, those of us who are working in business or advising business need to kind of put this topic on the table to say, if you take something like climate that Linda mentioned, there are so many people that are that do not believe in climate because it's been weaponized, politicized, whatever you want to describe. The more we can actually upskill people to actually understand, do actually you know the difference between kind of different types of emissions? Do you understand the pivot to alternative energies? Do we understand the commitments your government has made? And the more that we can actually understand kind of how it impacts a business model, whether you're in energy, whether you're in financial services and making loans to kind of different businesses, whether you're understanding the supply chain, if you're in, in manufacturing, to understand kind of where that work is done and what human conditions are provided to workers that you're kind of paying for goods for, the more we can provide that education in a non-threatening way, in a not you're right and I'm wrong, or I'm trying to kind of convince you of something which is so sacrosanct to some individual like it's a religious belief i think that's super super important and then as i said before engage the directors the the people who don't agree with this engage in civil discourse in organizations one of our surveys we did globally fifty-two thousand people um in 40 44 countries we asked about social issues two-thirds of people are having discussions on social issues that are personal to them in the workplace younger people and ethnic minorities are seeing a huge benefit from that so whether we like it or not, people are talking about these issues. Businesses have to kind of create awareness and upskilling around this and relevance to the business. But also they have to be great forums where people can actually, in a safe space, have some of these discussions. Wonderful. Absolutely agree. Uh, Lanier, did you want to add anything? Yeah, and I, I just add I have two things. One, sort of the employee research uh, resource groups. I've seen that, you know, picking up on, on Bouchon's, uh, you know, comment, you're seeing employees engage in these discussions and trying to figure out ways. There are also a number of great organizations. I, uh, I have uh, had the pleasure of working with an organization called the New Growth Innovation Network, Engine. Uh, and it really is a national, it's an organization of national thought leaders and practitioners focusing on how do you do inclusive growth work? How do you position people that have been left out to lead and drive and own growth, to identify you know, next economy opportunities, to address climate change from a business standpoint at the same time that you're addressing uh, you know, inequalities in our systems. And so you know, I mentioned Engine, there's a number of great organizations that are doing that work. And I think collectively organizations amplify the individual voices, uh, even the Brookings work, um, you know, you know, that, that, you know, both the seminars and the webinars like this and, the, you know, the, the you know, promulgation of research, you know, all, all creates opportunity to continue to advance the discussion. Wonderful. So let's talk a little bit about risks now. Um, Bouchon, what do you see as some potential business and workforce risks and how can business develop more of a sustainable mitigation plan? I mean, the biggest risk right now is obviously economic. Um, we are in a downturn. We are seeing kind of, well, you know, we, we've had good times for at least, you know, 13 years um, for many of us in business. And so as we might focus on the short term and we might be motivated by short term profit um, and just like politicians might be motiva motivated by kind of short term kind of policy decisions, we have to stay long, whether it's on climate, whether it's on inclusion, whether it's on shared prosperity. So, so kind of really making sure that the voices are at the table, we're thinking about plans with both the balance of kind of short um, and, and kind of midterm. And then the, the other the other risk are just, you know, that we're not prepared for the next existential shock that we'll no doubt get, whether it's war, famine, something climate related, something kind of civil related, that we need to be much better prepared. We, we did so well as a world and as a country at the start of at the start of COVID. Um, we've lost a lot of that. We don't have as much inclusion and tolerance and acceptance, and we've got rising, you know, divisiveness on many, many issues. 
um, the more that we can kind of be better prepared for the next um, existential shock that we'll have, which will in fact impact all of our businesses and kind of workplaces, I think that's a, the great opportunity that we need to be better prepared next time around. And let me right. just add, I think we yeah. see, um, you know, the news headlines, you know, sensationalized, um, you know, descriptions of violence and crime and, uh, you know, uh, violent crime in neighborhoods. And I think a lot of it has to do uh, with lack of economic opportunity, right? And so a lot of the work we do at our center is, you know, can we create a way for people to earn 50, 60, $100,000 a year just to be able to sustain their families. And there was some research that said, if someone, I'm gonna mess up the number now, uh, that if people could earn even 40, a, 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 a man could earn $48,000 a year, some number like that, the chances of, you know, uh, you know, recidivate, I think it was a study about formerly incarcerated individuals, that if they could figure out a way to earn $48,000 a year, the chances of them recidivating decreased by, you know, 70% or something. I'm, I'm messing up the exact numbers. But so part of, part of the risk is, you know, we want to live in places that are safe. We want to be able to, you know, enjoy the benefits of sharing the commons of an urban vibrancy of, uh, you know, diversity of people and institutions and income level. Um, but, uh, you know, the risk is if we don't figure out how to include more people in the, in the prosperity of our country and not as an afterthought, um, you know, the whole let me cake kind of philosophy will, you know, will always be something that we, we'd have to be concerned about. And there are some great examples of um, companies that are hiring formerly incarcerated people and are having tremendous success and a whole movement around that. Grayston Bakery is a great example of that. They make the um, the brownies that go into uh, Ben and Jerry's and other ice creams. And they, they've they just done some remarkable things. And there's a whole movement called, I think it's um, Can the Box or something, so that they're not prevented from getting hired. And that's a whole nother way to contribute. Awesome. All right. I wanted to spend a couple of minutes before we take more uh, questions from everyone about the challenges and solutions, specifically, uh, Bouchon, if you could focus a little on what's going on with upskilling. I'd love to hear more about that. Yeah. So uh, when you work with businesses around their change agenda, you realize that um, whether it's the advance of technology and as more firms are looking to move to the cloud and automate bits of work, whether it's the how do I prepare for ESG in my business model and think about um, driving you know, alternative energy sources, or even if I'm a tech firm, how do I think about externalities that, that I might suffer from my business, whether it's disinformation or something like you know, the data center and the, the, the heat requirements that it, that, that it puts pressure on the environment. The more that we can kind of create awareness and upskilling and manage the fear around technology change, um, ESG type changes, and other skills that people need to develop whilst they're in business, and, and not to dismiss the really important technical and trade skills that lots of people will need to have for jobs of the future and the human skills around, around leadership. The more businesses, and this is a thing where businesses have um, have realized that upskilling is so important, especially with such tight talent markets. You can't hire enough cybersecurity professionals. You have to bring people in from different backgrounds um, and kind of kind of train them and certify them in this area. So the more that we can actually, as businesses, map out what are the future skills um, that you need, how do businesses work with their, whether it's workforce development in the US, whether it's governments, whether it's um, you know colleges, whether they be trade colleges or further education colleges around the world, um, and all of the online platforms that that have access to free content, there's a huge role that business can play. But what they need to do is they need to again manage the fear and anxiety, commit to upskilling people, even in the times when people people need to be laid off. Upskilling them as part of those benefits and improving their future employability is a huge lever that businesses can pull 
much easier than kind of getting individuals to you know invest in themselves so so the, there's a big role but we've got to manage the fear and anxiety they've got to be relevant to the future and some of these what we've mentioned are no regret skills people need more digital skills more knowledge of environmental topics uh, better knowledge of leadership better knowledge of kind of innovation and, and some of the analytics pieces and the soft skills too absolutely that's great so I see a lot of examples of that. And uh, Lanier, what about uh, what's going on in communities where the economic disparities are stark? How can um, how can these be uh, led and scaled to workable solutions? Yeah, again, there's a number of pilot programs uh, that are proving to be successful. You know, I think all of our jobs now are to find the ones that uh, have promise and help them get more capital, right? There's so many little small initiatives. You know, I think we should, you know, pick 10 and and, and get them, you know, $100 million and say, do more of what, what you do. Uh, there's a great organization that's called 110. Uh, I sit on the a board with the uh, leader of 110 that has um, gotten exactly that. It's uh, focused on upskilling, um, you know, uh, people that have traditionally been left out. Uh, it galvanized the corporate community, uh, really a cross sector corporate uh, investment in, you know, inclusive upskilling. And I think we're going to see the result of it. So, it's just one example of one organization being able to go from pilot stage, you know, um, to scale to you know national impact because it's received the investment that that is necessary wow that's fantastic so there's so many great honor innovations out there that just need to be scaled and some solutions that are working so it's not a totally intractable it's about getting the capital and we saw how much wealth there is at the top and moving some of that wealth into where it can actually fuel and scale solutions that will work for everyone and enhance our economic as well as uh, social uh, and socioeconomic welfare. So uh, we're almost uh, leading to where I'm gonna ask for some more questions from the audience, but I wanted to give each of you an opportunity to share any final thoughts. Um, keep in mind, we have a very wide diversity of people listening in. We have employees and company representatives from every industry, sector, locations. We have students, academics doing research in this area. What is your call to action? So, I'll start. so, so one, one of the areas that we need to do a better job is build this into management curriculum um, at the business level. And so what I mean by that is shared prosperity, being a good global citizen, having more kind of civil discourse is a skill and a behavior. And some people learn that from childhood around the, the dinner table and they encourage discussions and it's kind of how they're raised and they kind of feel that it's their responsibility. And especially when they have a privilege to kind of give back in many different ways, whether it's it's capital, whether it's their time, whether it's creating opportunities. But a bunch of people haven't been, we haven't grown up in management models you know, from the 80s, and there hasn't been a lot of business literature around this topic. It's obviously changing now, but that, but our leaders of today, and that could be a 20-something leader, or it could be a 60-something leader, we aren't really equipped to do this. So we've got to, again, unashamedly, to still in Air's uh, word, we need to kind of put this back into management curriculums. Inclusive leadership is what we're all talking about. We need to start living that with better kind of defined examples. Love it. Thank you. And uh, Lanier? Yeah, I think um, you know. I was looking at even one of the questions in the uh, in the chat, and it, it you know we're at a period where there's been record corporate profits in um, in the U.S. economy, and um, again, profitability and uh, productivity fundamental to uh, you know the American dream and the American system of capitalism. So no one's complaining about that. But I think there's this opportunity now that looks at how do we position people that have been left out? How do we invest in people that have been left out? Not in a redistributive way, but to create systems, create business uh, propositions, to identify uh, growth areas in our 
U.S. economies and to invest to help people that are in the bottom 40% of our com com you know, economy to own, to lead, to drive, you know, future growth. That's the way we're going to truly, uh, you know, achieve the real dream of capitalism. And that's the way that we're going to, you know, be more competitive uh, as a U.S. economy. The call to action is that, you know, we all sit at the table, whether we're entrepreneurs, whether we're academic, corporate leaders, entrepreneurs, uh, we all have an opportunity to do this, but it takes intentionality. It takes us a little harder to do. It takes an extra research. It takes um, advocacy in a different way for resources. Uh, it takes a longer term perspective to see return on investment. It takes looking at return on investment in, uh, in a broad, with a broader spectrum. Uh, mm -hmm. So we all have an opportunity to, to do that. And if we do it together, um, you know, our world will be better. Wonderful, putting our money where our mouth is. Uh, we had a question from Edith. Uh, I don't know if Edith wants to read it or I can just read it. You can, uh, Professor. Okay, Edith, it says, is the elephant in the room the need for large scale federal government direct investment or tax incentives to incentivize private industry to take risks, willingness for less short-term profit, for example, to invest in hiring workers that are perceived to have more risk, whether they are young or old or long-term unemployed, et cetera, and invest in the areas covered in this series, climate justice, health equity, and shared prosperity. If not from the federal government or tax incentives, how will private industry be willing to absorb the, this risk? I would just say that, um businesses coming together to say how we're going to measure differently. Um, we're all part of the problem and part of, part of the solution, whether we're business people, investors, management consultants who advise businesses. If I'm out there advising a business to be more profitable, and part of that profitability is introducing automation, which automates away a bunch of jobs, and those jobs impact disproportionate, you know, underrepresented minorities, that company that's made a commitment to DEI goals will renege on those DEI goals, that they, they, they've made a commitment to their investors around inclusion will renege on those, but they might get the profitability. I'm not a good consultant if I'm making that advice. The business is not is not truly being um, honest with its kind of um, commitment to society by, by playing that. So that's that simple example. We need to be playing out in every major decision that businesses are making to say, we might get the short-term goal, but are we doing irreparable long-term damage to our business and our, and our society? So I think that businesses are loath to kind of look at kind of governments to mandate things. So the more that business communities can get ahead and say, let's start to, like the stakeholder capitalism goals that were set at the WEF were really good intent. We just need more disclosures and more to the point made earlier. We need to be living that in different economic cycles. Excellent. Okay. Um, I think we can uh, have a little time for a couple more questions and I'm going to look at the chat. Is, who else has some questions? And while you're thinking about your questions. Peter says, I agree with both speakers. Those issues and challenges are also present in the EU. Absolutely. There's no shortage of profitability. I think it's defining success, defining prosperity in, in a different way, measuring return. Um, I think that's that's how we all have to think about it, right? We wanna live in a world that has amenities and safety and uh, you know human connections. Uh, concentrated wealth has shown historically um, to be problematic. Absolutely. Um, Katie Boone, you have a question? Hi, yes. Um, I, uh, I'm i curious about when I've heard one of the speakers, and I'm sorry, I'm still catching up. Um, one of the speakers talk about a place-based approach to economic and community development to really build in those relationships. And I was curious how many of, um, of the, the folks in here, around here, are looking at forms of regenerative development as a way of being able to even shift place-based approaches to more of a place sourced approach where it's deeply connected to the culture of place, the history of place, multiple forms of economy, um, and really thinking more broadly about what, 
what wealth looks like. Um, and I was just curious if there's anybody here on the call, speakers, um, looking at regenerative economics, regenerative place sourced approaches to economic and community development as it pertains to entrepreneurship and innovation. Right. Yeah, thanks for that question. I'll mention, you know, really quickly. Um, the former U.S. Commerce uh, Secretary, Penny Pritzker, uh, formed uh, a, a, a foundation, the Pritzker Trial Foundation. Uh, and, you know, they're phenomenal, the Pritzker family, phenomenal investors, you know, from uh, large uh, corporate uh, uh, leaders in, in hospitality and financial services. But with their foundation, they uh, created something called the Chicago Prize. It is a $10 million uh, uh, grant that allows a local community-driven uh, organization to implement a project that creates, um, you know, economic opportunity, uh, you know, redevelops real estate and engages local residents. So it was a, a, a direct financial incentive. Uh, you know, I do the, um, with the team, the internal um, evaluations and screenings of the projects. And so to see, uh, you know, the first prize was a, a, a uh, went to an organization that uh, not only created new health outcomes and redeveloped a building that had been vacant for 20 plus years, but they created something called the digester, which is an anaerobic digester in an ethnic urban underserved area Again, next economy entrepreneurship, uh, you know, leveraging, uh, you know, this the uh, the investment made by the Priskers. I've seen similar work in Detroit, right? Just downtown Detroit, where you know the founder of Quicken Loan, Dan Gilbert, and others reinvested in uh, downtown uh, Detroit. The city then doing other initiatives to encourage small business. So uh, there's great examples of public private place-based partnerships taking taking place in the U.S. and I'm sure around the world. Uh, those are just two examples that are top of mind for me. Very inspiring. Thank you. Um, we have time for one more question. How does gender equity play a role in transparency and inclusivity? Specifically, I missed the rest of it. Specifically, Investments, investments in women-led women businesses and philanthropic support for organizations that support women and girls. And again, I, I, um, the, this last couple of years, I've seen, you know, a real intentionality around creating our more women of color leading big philanthropy, so in leadership roles, and, and both as as the executive director, CEO, on corporate boards as well as uh, you know, allocation of resources to women entrepreneurs, to social enterprises, to nonprofit organizations. I think if you, you know, the gender equity issue has been raised and I think um, I'm seeing a number of instances where you know, corporate community and the you know, big uh, philanthropically motivated impact investors are also uh, you know, getting capital to, to issues and people and organizations that uh, you know are, are addressing um, you know creating opportunities for women and girls and we need to move really quickly on this because it's not just about labor force participation or pay it's about just experience at work in our research it's basically telling us that by seven to eight percentage points women are feeling that they're getting less opportunities that they're less listened to that they they're less likely to um, uh, recommend their employer so it's not just on pay and kind of access to jobs, but it's also on kind of experience at jobs, which is really a startling stat that we all need to kind of move move the needle on. Great. And I'm going to do a shout out for Lisa Kaplowitz Center for Women in Business at Rutgers Business School. She's doing a phenomenal job and actually just published an article in Harvard, um, a Harvard Business Review article with all on this issue of women of color, et cetera. So we're just about out of time and I regret it because we could go on for days. Um, and I wanted to make sure that uh, we honor everybody's time. And I wanna let you know that uh, we will be posting the recording, the PowerPoints, as well as uh, helpful resources, which we put together uh, on the website that Deborah will share in the chat. 
And in here we have reports uh, with links to the World Bank, uh, Harvard Business School, Brookings Institute, where Lanier now has an affiliation. Uh, we have three books that I personally have recommended. Uh, one is called Plenitude um, by Juliet Shore, uh, another book by Michael Schumann called The Local Economy Solution, and uh, the third book called The Great Divide by the Nobel laureate um, Joseph Stiglitz. Then we also talk about companies leading the way, uh, including Bank of America, Microsoft, Siemens, Verizon, and other Ideas 42, and some articles, including articles um, published by PwC that Bouchon was involved in, as well as multiple articles and media mentions that Lanier has been involved in, as well as a study by the New York Times, which I thought was wonderful to include, uh, showing a key to reducing poverty is more friendships between rich and poor. So thank you, everybody. Thank you to our speakers. Yay. Yes. Great job. And we will be posting this early next week. Um, I thought it was a very rich and uh, important and critically timed uh, conversation. Thank you, everyone. And we will be in touch. Take care. Thank you all. Good day.